Hello and welcome to the teaching ministry of Pastor Kenneth G. Dentley Sr. We pray that today's message will dig deep into the soil of your heart, producing the character of Jesus Christ in your life. David said in Psalm 119 that the entrance of God's word gives light and understanding to the simple. So let this word enter your spirit and watch the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ invade your life. the Lord. Open your Bibles to the book of Galatians chapter 5. The book of Galatians chapter 5. Paul's writing to the church of Galatia. Tonight we're talking about the works of the flesh. I've heard many sermons on the fruit of the Spirit, but I don't too much hear messages on the works of the flesh. And the Bible makes us stark contrast between the fruit of the Spirit and the fruit of the flesh. You say the works of the flesh. No, it's the same thing. Fruit of the flesh, the produce of the flesh, the works of the flesh. So tonight we want to center in. We've talked about the fruit of the Spirit in previous teachings. And we showed you what God expects of us. But starting with this, I'm going to show you, and not only am I going to show you this, we're going to define the works of the flesh. We're going to take all of the works one by one. And we're going to define them because some of you assume that you know what they mean. And you quick to say, well, I don't do that. But if you look carefully at the meaning of those words, then you might discover that you may be walking in some part or portion of that word or that term. So we're committed to setting people free, to getting people in the body of Christ free. We want you to live victorious, overcoming lives. And the only way we're going to be able to live an overcoming victorious life over the devil is that we first learn to live an overcoming overcoming victorious life over our flesh. Amen. You only have power and authority over the enemy to the degree that you have power and authority over your flesh. Many people like the seven sons of Sceva are trying to cast devils out of other people when they got devils in themselves. Hello. Amen. And so if we're walking according to the works of the flesh or the fruit of the flesh, that means that we have no power or authority against the adversary. So we are committed to teaching you how you can overcome the sins of your flesh. Amen. Amen. So let's look at Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. I am reading from the New King James Version for those of you that are listening by tape. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. Verse number 19. I think I did tell you that, right? The works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. I like that part, such like. Because man, if he didn't get you in the top things, he sure got you in that such like. I'm telling you, he didn't leave no stone unturned. Amen. Amen. So if you're not walking in those things, whatever you're walking in that pleases your flesh, it's included in the such like. Of the which I tell you before. Now, here's what the Bible has to say about this. This is not Kenneth Dentley's version. And you don't need any private interpretation to figure this one out. He says, which I tell you before. In other words, it's been stated before. As I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. That's plain, simple. So that's saying if you're walking in any of the works of the flesh, you will not inherit God's kingdom. Simple. Now there's teachings out in the body of Christ today that says that you can walk in these things and if you die you go to heaven you will lose reward but you go to heaven according to Paul here they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God and if we look at the Old Testament type and shadow of the new 
the very things that's listed here are the things that kept Israel from going into the promised land. Hello. Amen. So therefore, we make a contrast and a parallel, and we say that God never changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. That means that if Israel could not enter into the kingdom of the promised uh, land because of sin or because of the works of their flesh, the believer cannot enter into the kingdom of God because of sin and the work of their flesh. There are many times Paul said to the Corinthians church, he said to the church of Galatia, he said to the church, I talked about it in the book of Ephesians, several scriptures that validate this point. And Jesus even said to the degree, I'm a little ahead of myself, but Jesus said, if your arm or your eyes or anything on your body offends you, it's better for you to cut it off than to be what? Cast into hell with all your body parts still intact. Now, where did Jesus say a person was going? He says, better for you to go to life, enter into life, main, than to enter into hell with your full body parts intact. So Jesus himself is saying, people who operate according to the flesh will not inherit the kingdom of God. A lot of people are going to be surprised on the day of the resurrection. They're going to be surprised. You are going to be very surprised. When we go and stand before the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven and we meet all the saints of God and our loved ones that went on before us, there are some people that you're going to ask, where's so-and-so? And the angels are going to say, they did not make it. Mm. And you say, why? Because they were. Now remember, guys, God's word does not change to suit us. Let me read to you a, a story, a vision, rather. I... um. Picked this up off of the internet. I went to a website. David Kirkwood is the, is, the, um, is the author of this particular vision that he had. And I was reading this because it's something that sparked my attention. Normally when the Holy Spirit leads me somewhere, I always find something that I can extract from this or something that has to do relatively with something that the Lord is teaching me or either having me to teach the church. And when I read this particular one, I said, I've got to use this one. So I wrote David and I told him and I asked him for permission to be able to, to, to read this out in the congregation. And it's going to be recorded on tape. So for everyone that's listening by audio cassette, David Kirkwood is the person that had this vision, this experience. And not only that, you can find it on the website. He has a website. I'll give you the website. It's on www.shepherdserve.org. And so if you're interested in any one of his, uh, his articles and things like that, you, can, uh, you feel free to, uh, to go to the website. He called it a parable of revival. So listen very carefully. As I was praying and fasting about the need for revival and the work of the Holy Spirit, I received a revelation that helped me to understand what is and what will be happening in the church. It was not a vision that I saw with my eyes, but a revelation that I saw in my heart. Many, may, I, may I say, rather, I am not one who is given to visions. And this was the first time anything like this ever happened to me. I will describe what I saw in the Revelation. First, I saw many crowds of people. Some crowds were very large. Some were medium-sized. Some were quite small. The largest group contained thousands of people. The smallest groups contained only a handful. The members of each group huddled together for warmth because it was very cold. All were shivering, and when you spoke, you could see his breath. Additionally, most within the crowd were dirty. Some were filthier than others, as if they had been workers in a coal mine, covered with soot from head to toe. These also stunk, like the stench of garbage. Others were not as filthy, but were more desperate in desperate need of cleansing. These masses of people all stood at the base of an immense dam which held back a huge reservoir. The dam was hundreds and hundreds of feet high, and it stretched as far as I could see in any direction. The body of water it held back was of equal proportion. I looked more closely at the dam. I noticed that it was built of bricks. Words were written on each brick, and as I began to read what was written, on some of the bricks, I noticed 
that all were similar in this respect. Each one had written upon it a single sin. For example, one, had, one brick had on it gossip, and on another was written the word lustful. Also written under each sin was someone's name. For example, a brick might have on it liar, under that John Doe. There were many bricks that had the same sin written on them, and many people's names were written on more than one brick. I look back at the crowds of filthy, shivering people. Most of them all were standing, but occasionally one in the crowd would kneel or fall on his face and begin to weep, confessing his sins and asking God to cleanse him. When he did, a brick from the dam would burst out of his place by the force of the water behind it, and once ejected, the brick would shatter into fine dust and disappear. The water that would then gush, uh, the water rather, that, that would then gush through the hole would stream through the air, pouring itself on the kneeling one, washing him of his filth. Sometimes several or many bricks would burst forth from the dam, either all at the same time or over a period of time, as long as the person continued to kneel and pray. In those cases, the streams that would pour forth from the hole in the dam would converge to fall together with great force upon the kneeling one, and the change in the person's appearance would be quite dramatic. Some of the dirtiest became the most clean in a short period of time. I also discovered that the water that poured forth from the holes of the dam was quite warm. When it fell upon those who knelt, it not only cleansed them, but it also warmed them to the core. They would laugh and delight and sing with joy as they were being washed. The reaction of those in the groups who stood and watched the kneeling ones was mixed. Often, many of those nearby would move away from the kneeling one, not wanting to get wet. On occasion, the entire group would draw back so far that the kneeling one was left alone under his warm waterfall. However, just as often, some of those near one who was kneeling would also kneel, confessing their sins. Again, the bricks would burst from the dam and water would gush out, cleansing and warming them. Is this interesting or what? On occasion, a large majority of people standing in one group would one after the other kneel or bow and begin to weep for their sins. The force of many streams of water that consequently converged and fell over them would be very great, bringing enormous blessings, powerful anointing, and many gifts. However, in no case did I see a group in which everyone knelt. Often those who stood among groups in which many people were kneeling would leave to join another group in which many were standing. Also, I sometimes saw a person kneel only because so many others were kneeling. When he did, however, no bricks burst forth from the dam. No water was poured forth, and that person remained filthy and cold. Two other things I witnessed as I watched the crowds of people. Occasionally, one of those who were standing would look up to the dam and see a brick with his name on it. Out of embarrassment, he would climb up the dam's fence, face to that brick to try to pull it out of its place with his own hands. No one who attempted this ever succeeded. However, because it was impossible. I occasionally saw one who had been kneeling stand up again. When he did, he immediately became somewhat dirty and the force of the waterfall upon him lessened. As he began pointing his finger at those who never knelt, proudly criticizing them with his mouth, his waterfall stopped and became very dirty again. Most of those who were kneeling, however, would speak lovingly to those standing around them saying, oh, it's wonderful under this warm cleansing stream. You can be washed of your filth. Please, won't you join me? Let me tell you some of the sins that were written on the bricks. One which had my name written on it said, fearful of man. When I saw it, I immediately admitted my guilt before God and asked for his forgiveness and grace to fear no one but him. Now he's starting off. Here's this. As a pastor, I was shown numerous bricks that belonged to people in my own congregation. There were many of the same sins written on the bricks. Some said, friend of the world. Many said, lukewarm. Others said, judgmental. Others, idolaters, which means you make things in your life more important than God. Many people in the church 
are more excited about their hobbies and pleasures than God. Some said immorality, which includes not only adultery, but dwelling on immoral thoughts. Some said entertains herself by watching people do immoral things on television. Another one said views internet pornography. Another one said meditate on acts of homosexuality. Another said sexually active teenager. On some bricks were written bitterness against another. Another one mistreats his wife. Another one speaks against his own brothers. Another one lovers of money. Another one lovers of pleasure. Another one cares only about himself. Another one said receives payment for work under the table to avoid taxes. Another one wasteful steward. Another one uses God money to support what God hates. Ooh. Another one does not care about the poor. Another one does not even tithe. And around those bricks were added many other bricks that had justifications for this sin. There was immodest. Another one, always convinced she's right. Another one, not submissive to her husband. I also, many, also saw many which says, do not care about those who have never heard the gospel. Some said gossip, slander, fault finding, uses offensive speech, worthless religion, does not bridle their tongue. One says, does not financially support young children from a, for, for, a former marriage. One said, does not honor parents. Another one says, rarely keeps promises. Another one says, listen to a music that exalts what God hates. Another one said, full of unbelief. Another one said, unclean habits and addictions. Another one said, self-indulgent. Uh, another one says, prayerlessness. Another one says, forsakes the assembly of the church. Another one says, does not desire to read God's word. Many bricks says, is not training children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. There are many others which I have not mentioned, but which are all found in the Bible. The Bible, which we all profess and believe to be God's word, on some bricks were even written, twist scriptures to make it mean what it does not mean. Another one says, redefines the commandment to fit his lifestyle. The mortar that held the bricks in place also had words written on it, symbolizing four sins that held all the other sins in place. There were pride, hypocrisy, little or no love for God, and sins of shepherds. Before other sins can be dislodged, these must first be weakened. Pride keeps us from admitting our sins. Hypocrisy is acting one way at church and another way at other times, and it must be confessed. All sins are symptoms of bigger sins, little or no love for God. If we loved him with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, we would serve and obey him passionately. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments, John 14 and 15. Finally and fourth, if leaders in the church set the wrong examples, their followers would have an excuse to hold on to their sins. So that's why he said the sins of the shepherds. Let's go back to the people in the crowds. As I watch, occasionally a person was, who was standing would point his finger at a nearby group that was laughing and singing as they knelt under the waterfall and say, that waterfall can't be from God because their doctrine is wrong in some way. But the Lord reminded me that he did not say it is those who have pure doctrine who will see God, but those who have pure hearts, Matthew 5 and 8. Jesus didn't say that we would know them by their doctrine, but we will know them by their fruit. He said the mark of his true disciple was not a perfect doctrine, but love for one another. Just because a group's doctrine is partially wrong in certain non-essentials does not mean that God will not pour his spirit on them when they humble themselves and begin to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Some of the bricks in the dam said, puffed up with knowledge, doctrinal pride, denominational loyalty that transcends love for the entire body. In other words, your denominational loyalty is greater than your love for the body. As time passed, more and more of those standing began to kneel, weeping as they confessed their sins and repented. Bricks exploded from the great dam like kernels of popcorn, and more water poured forth with a mighty roar until the scene compared to Niagara Falls, not only on a much larger scale. The kneeling ones lifted their hands, laughed, sang, and prayed in what became a great river that flowed to many dry places on the earth. Eventually, it became such a torrent that those kneeling in it were swept away as they rejoiced and sang songs to their God. Finally, the water ceased flowing. 
As the reservoir had run dry, there were those who were still standing, looking at one another with smug approval. The bricks on which their names were written were still in place, suspended in air only by human pride. Then, suddenly, without the slightest warning, every brick in the dam began to fall, converging with other bricks on which they were written their names in and in terror, the standing one watched as the pile of bricks fell with deadly accuracy, first knocking them to the ground and killing and crushing them until all that could be seen was heaps of bricks. I was reminded that Jesus said, everyone who exalts himself shall be humbled, but he who humbled himself shall be exalted. Which are you? It brings me to remembrance of scripture that Jesus said, whoever falls on this rock, will be broken. But whosoever the rock falls on will be crushed to powder. As I read that, 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 that vision, I began to see myself in some of these things. My first response is repentance. Not excuses, repentance. When I found myself, because there's there some things that were listening that God spoke to me about, and I knew he was speaking to me about, and I procrastinated or whatever, procrastinated or whatever. Yeah, I got time, or whatever, take care of that or whatever. So and God just, God just emphatically, I began to repent. Lord, forgive me. Forgive me of this wrong, the thing that I've done. Are you with me? Yeah. Don't try to figure out what's going on in my life. You need to figure out what's going on in your own. You follow what I'm saying? But once again, here it is. The works of the flesh. So some of the things that we don't even think about, God thinks about. Some of these things on it, you I mean, you, you would read this thing and you would go like, my goodness, I didn't even know that God was even serious about that. I mean, it, folks, I'm telling there are things that you and I do that we don't even realize that God even takes an account of. Hello? But they're works of the flesh. And the Bible tells us that when we operate in the works of the flesh, we cannot please God. Hello, somebody. Can you shout in the house? Amen. Turn to Joshua chapter 5. And I'm just laying the foundation. I'm not even into the meat of this thing yet. The Lord's been dealing with us concerning our heart. And in talking about the heart, one of the things I want to share with you out of the book of Joshua chapter 5. Huh? Oh, Joshua chapter 5. Good to see Brandon in the house tonight. Verse number two says this. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives for yourselves and circumcise the sons of Israel again the second time. So Joshua made flint knives for himself and circumcised the sons of Israel at the heel of the foreskins. Ooh, Lord Jesus. And this is the reason why Joshua circumcised them. All the people who came out of Egypt who were males, all the men of war had died in the wilderness in the way after they had come out of Egypt. They came out of Egypt, people, and they died, right? Now, we're going to talk about that in a minute. For all the people who came out had been circumcised, but all the people who were born in the wilderness on the way as they came out of Egypt had not been circumcised. For the children of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness. To all the people who were men of war, who came out of Egypt, were consumed. Why were they consumed? Because they did not obey the voice of the Lord, to whom the Lord swore that he would, he would not show them the land which the Lord had sworn to their fathers, that he would give us a land flowing with milk and honey. I just said that. The Bible says, Paul said in the book of Galatians, that they who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. He told the church at Rome, he says, the people who do these things and even the one who have pleasure in those that do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So that means you don't even necessarily have to be doing this kind of stuff, folks. But if you got delight in pleasure and folks that do it, the Bible says, same thing on you. You remember, the, 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 one of the sins here, it, it didn't say that the woman was necessarily, uh, uh, she was uh, 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 necessarily, uh, uh, doing immoral things, but, the, the, but the, 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 the thing here said, entertains herself by watching people do immoral things on TV. And a lot of times we go to the movies and we see all kinds of immoral filth on television and we're not doing it, but we're delighting in it. And God says, that's sin. 
Hello? And these people have to, they have to be washed and cleansed. But see, you don't think nothing about it. How many times have you taken your money and gone to the movies and, and see immoral filth and trash things that Hollywood pro pro uh, propagates and promotes, amen, and spread throughout the entire land, the thing that God hates? We, and another thing he said, using God's money to support what God hates. We take our hard-earned dollars, what we're supposed to be good stewards over, and we go to movies and we watch these movies. They're talking about witchcraft. They're talking about sexuality and things like that. And we watch it. And we think nothing about it. And God said, that's sin. Amen. And it must be confessed and repented of. He said, you have pleasure in that. You have no place in the kingdom of God. And this is serious stuff, man. God is cleaning up his house. Why? He's calling the church to circumcise the foreskin right now. That means cut off. Roll away the reproach of Egypt. Let's read. Let's keep on reading. Notice what he says here. Oh, Lord, this thing is, is getting, <laughs> it gets good. They were consumed because they did not obey the voice of the Lord, to whom the Lord swore that he would not show them the land which the Lord had shown, uh, swore to their fathers that he would give us, a land flowing with milk and honey. So Joshua circumcised their sons whom he raised up in their place, for they were uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. So it was when they had finished circumcising all the people that they stayed in their places in the camp till they were healed. Then the Lord said to Joshua, this day I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. Therefore, they named the place of the name of this place is called Gilgal or the rolling away unto this day. OK, y'all see that Gilgal. Remember Gilgal. It was a Gilgal. Now, let's talk about circumcision just for a few minutes. The term circumcision was the outward seal of the old covenant. It is a type of the new covenant seal of water baptism. Remember, uh, circumcision went out in the days of the, uh, when the Gentiles started getting born again or whatever. Circumcision went out. Baptism actually took place or came in. See, when God does something, it's like an overlapping process. When God introduces something new, the old is still remaining. And it overlaps. Your old is still there. But then, you remember, because see, Jesus, even though he came and introduced the new covenant, Jesus operated as a prophet under the old covenant. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John actually is the Old Covenant. That's the end of the Old Covenant. But at the same time, he was introducing the New Covenant while the Old Covenant was slowly fading away. You follow what I'm saying? You know, when, when, a, when a, in television we call uh, something, we call it fade out or fade to black. When you see uh, the fade to black, right then a picture comes back on. You know, uh, the old, you can see that it's going out and faded, and then they bring another picture in. And that's a smooth transition. And that's how God does things. He does things smoothly. He, he, the old can still be remaining. In fact, well, after, after Jesus had died and the veil of the temple was written too, they were still offering sacrifices and things like that, even though God wasn't even in the temple. They were still offering sacrifices into the place that they could no longer have a high priest to go into the holies of holies on the day of atonement because the lineage of the high priest had stopped. <laughs> you follow what I'm saying? So God done away with that so that he may introduce the new. So when, 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 when John the Baptist started preaching, remember, he started preaching and he didn't preach a gospel of circumcision. He preached what? Repentance and baptism. Confessing their sins. Rolling away their reproach. You're following what I'm saying. And then in the new covenant, what did God say? Except a man be born again and baptized in the spirit, baptized in the water, he has no life in him, right? So therefore, we got to understand Old Testament circumcision, New Testament baptism, the rolling away of the reproach, dead to sin and trespasses. Y'all with me? Now, there is, there is a, a, a circumcision that is spiritual, which is the circumcision of the heart, mentioned in the Old and New Testament that refers to the cutting away of the old man and the flesh. Now, once again, it was, they were commanded to take a flint knife and cut away. If anybody know anything about circumcision, when a male child is born, they have a lot of excess of skin on the foreskin of the, the, the boy's private part. Are you with me? And if it's left there, he grows into a man. He has a lot of problems. He has a lot of pain and urination. He has a lot of, uh, 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 a lot of um, uh, what's the word, uh, 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 infection and bacteria in that particular part of his flesh, unless that thing is cut off and thrown away. You follow what I'm saying? The foreskin, basically, uh, uh, the, the flesh, that part of the flesh that needs to be cut off, that's what the Bible calls the flesh. When we got born again, our spirits man were born. 
Here it is. God said to, to, to Abraham, every male child that is born among you is to be circumcised on the eighth day. Once he's born into this world, he is to be circumcised on the eighth day. Okay? Once, here it is, we are born into the kingdom of God. The first thing that we need to do is we need to begin the circumcision process. The cutting away of the stuff that we used to do. Rolling away the reproach of Egypt. When the Bible speaks of Egypt, people, he's talking about the world. Are you with me? Come on, say the world. The world. Come on, say the world. The world. So we got to understand, it's something I want to just, I tell you what. L l l <sighs> tell you what, let me just go on with that because I, my time is running out and I'm trying to, what can I hit you with right now that's going to, okay, let's just go on. I'll just flow with it. If what I can't get in tonight, I'll just go on with it, okay? All right? So circumcision signified the purity of the heart. It is the inward circumcision affected by the spirit. Circumcision is a symbol shadowing forth the sanctification of the Holy Spirit has now given the way to the, to the, to the symbol of baptism. Once again, remember the old covenant, circumcision, but in the new covenant, baptism with water. You with me? The rolling away of the sins of our flesh, right? Now, let me show you this. The term mean, means literally cutting around. This rite was practiced by diverse races, like today, Gentiles still are, uh, you know, circumcised. A child is circumcised when they get born into the hospital, right? But it was appointed by God to be the special badge of his appointed people. If anybody had any doubts, listen, you can wear something or whatever and, and fake it, but you can't fake circumcision. If you said that I am a Jew, uh, I'm circumcised, but you don't look like one, one thing you have to do is remove your clothing and they can look at your parts and they can tell this man is circumcised, he's a Jew. That was a special identification badge that God chose and selected for his chosen people. You follow what I'm saying? Same thing with baptism today. But here is it. Here is it. Let me show you this. That's why there should be such a difference between the world's way of living and the church way of living because they can tell we've got to be circumcised because we don't even involve ourselves in the things that they do. Hello? You look at a Gentile, his genitals look different from the Jewish genital. Because of circumcision, right? Everybody know what I'm talking about in here, right? So therefore, people ought to be able to look at the deepest inner post part, the privacy of your life, and tell that you are a Jew and not a Gentile because of your lifestyle. You're not stinking all over the place. You don't have a lot of bacteria going on when you, amen, praise God. <laughs> Come on, look at somebody and say, is he talking to you tonight, Lord of God? Amen, amen. Hallelujah. That's an abiding sign of their consecration to God. The abiding sign of my consecration to God is the cutting off of my foreskin. And I'm not talking about my genital area. I'm talking about, bless God, the, 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 what I look like. What I, listen, you can't. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> See, y'all, y'all, y'all got it. Y'all, you guys have got to hear what I'm saying. You got to hear what I'm saying because it, it, it's, it's private, but that's the thing. The privacy of your life, what you got hidden. See, it's covered. You can't see it, but that's what God's after. He's after your parts that's covered that nobody else can see but you. But all things are no, naked and exposed before God in whom we have to deal with. And so therefore, you can hide it from pastor. You can hide it from the elders, but you can't hide it from God. God smells that stinking. He sees the bacteria. Come on, somebody. Now, I'm not trying to be funny. I'm not trying to be gross because this is a very serious thing. This is a serious matter because there's too much sin in the church. There's too much sin. There's the need for repentance and cleansing and forsaking and, con and, and, and all kinds of, man, godly things in the church today because it's, 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 it's a mess out there. Mm, hallelujah. We wear nice clothes on the outside, but what do we look like when we're standing in the mirror? What do we see? Some of us see some things that we don't really like. And if we don't like it, what do you think God feels about it? Well, glory to God. Mm. Three classes of people to be circumcised. Number one, all male children of Israel. Number two, all male servants and children. That means that if you, if you got a servant, you hired a servant, he had, in order to work for you, he had to be circumcised and his whole entire children, all of his children, male children rather. And number three, males are foreigners in Egypt. 
I mean, in Israel. In other words, if you, uh, if you, in order for you to enjoy the privileges of Jewish citizenship, if you were going to be a Jewish citizen, or you're going to convert to Judaism, you have to be circumcised. No ifs, ands, and buts about it. You cannot dwell among those people except you first be circumcised. Now, what is God saying? People who call themselves children of God, but they're not even circumcised. They say they're saved, but not even circumcised still do the same things that they were doing when they were out in the world. Hello. Come on, people. God says these people are not going to inherit. I'm telling you, let me tell you, the Bible says people that says, Lord, Lord, not going to enter in that day. Not many people that say, Lord, Lord. Everybody that says, Lord, 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 Lord. Lord. And, and to tell you the truth, you know, it sometimes disturbed me to see all this activity that's going on in the body today. But you know what God told me? He says, son, remember I said, let the wheat and the tares grow together. So remember, while the wheat are growing, the tares are growing at the same time. And the tares look exactly like the wheat. That's why he tells us, don't try to make the difference or the distinction between the two. Let them grow together. At the end, when harvest time comes, I'm going to send my holy angels and those guys know who are mine and who's not. Now the Bible says, if any man have the spirit of Christ or have not the spirit of Christ, he's none of his. So therefore, if we got the spirit of Christ on the inside of us, producing the nature of God on the inside, what's on the inside ought to reflect the outside. Remember, because Jesus said, on the, in the heart of the man proceeds evil thoughts and adulteries and murders and all this stuff. That's because that's in the heart. So therefore, if you take that out and replace it with the nature of God or the spirit of God, what's going to come out? Holiness, righteousness, Amen. peace, joy, the fruit of the spirit. Amen. So that means that if we say we're saved, but we're still doing the things the world do and have no remorse, no regret, have no sense of condemnation at all, that means we don't even belong to him. We've been fooled by some preacher that told us, you say this prayer right here and you're saved. Many people walk up the aisle. And what do we do? We give them a card, make a decision for Christ. And they make a decision for Christ. But the Bible did not say, decide for Christ. He didn't even say, ask Christ into your heart. First thing he says is, repent. <laughs> so people, what they do, they come and they ask Jesus to come into their heart. But they never repent. And there is no such thing as salvation without repentance. That's the way you get into the kingdom, repentance. Well, I disagree. Well, I'm sorry. That's what the Bible teaches. And we are a product of what we've been taught. I believe the same thing. I taught the same thing. I believe just like everybody else believed. And I come to find out well, after reading the scriptures, it's the same. this ain't the same as what I'm seeing in the book of Acts here. Jesus said, except you perish, I mean, except you, you repent, rather, you shall likewise perish. And who was he talking to? He was talking to the Jewish people. He was talking about, like, the, to the Christians of their day. Oh, Lord. Don't get bad with me. During the journey in the wilderness, the practice of circumcision fell into disuse. But it was resumed by the command of Joshua before they entered into the promised land. Notice, before God even let them go into the promised land, they had to be circumcised. So you wonder what's keeping you out of the promises of God? Circumcision. In fact, in, in, in Elisha's journey with Elijah, before Elijah was taken up to heaven, the Bible says that the first place that they were was Gilgal. In other words, they were at the place of circumcision. Are you with me? They went, <laughs> they went from Gilgal, and then I believe where, where the next place they went. They went to, uh, I think I wrote it down in my notes here somewhere. Glory to God, let me see if I can find it. I can find it. Yeah, that's right. Went from there to Bethel. The house of God. To, from there to Jericho, the place of palm trees and refreshing. To the next place was to Jordan, the place of death. Cross over the Jordan River, that's it, the place of death. And the next place, Elijah went into heaven and Elisha took up the mantle. In other words, he went to a place of state of transformation. He went into and entered into his promised land. That's why believers struggle and struggle and struggle today. And trying to get in, trying to possess the promises of God, and working hard, trying to get the promises of God to manifest in their life, to no avail, simply because they have not even started at Gilgal. Save people. Still shacking. Save people. Amen. Still doing the same thing in the world. Still going to parties. 
having a good time. Hello. No saved friends, all unsaved friends. Um, we save, but we associate with people in the, we don't like them church people. We, we're gonna so we got friends in the world, but we don't have no saved friends. Well, glory to God. Can anybody shout in the house? Still lukewarm, still friends of the world. Amen. Still immoral. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. Mistreating your wife or your husband. Hello, lovers of money, lovers of pleasure. That's the stuff the world do. Well, can, can you shout amen? amen? Still cussing people out when they cut you off on the road. The world do that kind of stuff. Road rage is what they call it. Jesus called it sin. He called it anger, violence. Hello. Wrath. That's right. You follow what I'm saying? So we think it's okay. That's the world's behavior. Just, just yesterday, we were driving, going down the road, going to the bank. Amen. And here it is. We're driving in our lane. Just driving our lane. And here somebody come in the lane next to me. And I'm about to tear the front of my car. Up. So I toot my horn. Thomp, thomp. And they came anyway. So I just kind of backed off, let them go through. And I just smiled about it because I've learned many lessons in patience driving on the road. Well, praise God. Hope you get where you got to go. And he went in the other lane to make a turn. And then when I got next to him, he blew his horn and looked at me like I'm the one in the wrong. But, praise God, I didn't get upset, angry, blow my horn, look at him like, huh? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I didn't do that. Why? Because that's not in my nature. I've been cleansed from that. Y'all hear what I'm saying? That's the world's behavior, people. That's not the belief. We, we got the spirit of God on the inside, and that's producing the nature of God. On, on the, so if we cut away the flesh, guess what's going to show up? The nature of God, the new nature, the new creation ought to show up. Can you shout amen? amen. My God, will the real believers please stand up? Thank you. Oh, <laughs> amen. No other race of people were commanded to be circumcised since God except God's chosen people. Him and let me close on this one right here. Uh, uh, Lord Jesus. First Peter chapter two. Let me show you something. I'm gonna make you shout. I'm gonna make you shout. Hallelujah. Run, skip, hop, do what you got to do. But you're gonna you're gonna love this one right here. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. See, God's dealing with our heart. He dealt with our heart a few weeks ago, right? Now He said, "Now I'm dealing with your flesh," because you got a good heart. A lot of people got good things on the inside of them. You follow what I'm saying? But that flesh is the mess. Yes, it is. If you ever cut that flesh away, you will see a person you've never seen before. True. You'll fall in love with a new person all over again. You have to be careful because you fall in love with yourself, but you don't realize you're falling in love with the nature of God on the inside of you. You'll be so happy that you found holiness and peace and joy yes. and delight in God. Can you show? All these material things don't matter to you anymore. You follow what I'm saying? You've been transformed. Amen. Amen. I'm not talking to you when I read in the scripture. I'm talking with what I've experienced as well as reading in the scripture. And I protect myself now because I've, I've experienced that spiritual bliss. No, it ain't no chill bumps rolling down my spine. It ain't no who. No, it ain't. Because a lot of the people do that kind of stuff like they're in sin. You follow what I'm saying? Because when you're in sin, you got to do things to make people think you're spiritual and holy. You follow what I'm saying? You got to act the part. You gotta, that's hypocritical. You got to act the role, play actors. Right? But when you're saved and you know you're walking with the Lord, Father, you don't have to ring no bell, tooth, no horn. You know you got the peace and the joy and the bubbles flowing up on the inside of you. Can you shout amen? All right, here it is. Let me close with this. He says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Oh, my God, this is a good one. In verse number 9, he said, but you, oh, say me. Put your name in there. But Kenneth is a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who've called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who were once not a people, but now are the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Can you shout amen? Now, now notice this. He says this. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims 
Abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. Got to talk about that. Can't talk about it tonight. Don't have time. But fleshly lust that wars and, and is antagonistic against the soul. You follow what I'm saying? And here's what else he says. He says, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, notice, the good works which they observe. When they look at us, that's what they ought to be seeing, the fruit of the Spirit, the produce of the Spirit. They ought to be seeing an apple tree. If an apple seed that is planted, there ought to be an apple tree sometime, someday. Hello? How long you been growing that apple tree? My God, this is the 50th year, and I ain't seen no apple yet. You need to cut that thing down. You got the wrong seed planted down there. I mean, if the nature of God is on the inside of you, it ought to show up sometime. Just as mean and honoring and cantankerous as you want to be. Talking about I'm saved, and I know I am. No, you're not. Get saved. Start all over again. Say, Lord, we scratch everything. Let's just start all over again. Let's do the real thing this time. A lot of people are deceived. In church, deceived. Think they are. And the sad part about it is preachers just, they're just validating people in their sin. Can't do that, folks. I love you too much. Don't want you to be condemned with the world. Can't validate you in your sin. And I hope you don't validate me in mine. Can you shout amen? amen? Oh, can you shout amen? amen? Glorify God in the day of visitation. My God, this is some good stuff. I tell you the truth. I got to quit, though, because, you know, time is out. and I don't want to keep you all all night. I can, but I don't want to. Amen, because I want to go home, too. Amen. In the Old Testament, the spiritual idea attached to circumcision was a symbol of purity. We read about circumc uncircumcised lips, uncircumcised ears, uncircumcised hearts. The fruit of a tree that is unclean is spoken of as uncircumcised. Finally, circumcision was to be performed on males born and brought of the Israelites. It was to be done on the eighth day. It was done even on the Sabbath day. It was done with knives of flint. Now let me put this in here in my closing. That means that we are to use the sword of the spirit. The sword of the spirit to cut off the flesh. It's desires, it's craving, it's appetites, it's lust, and it's works. That's the only thing that's going to deal with your flesh. You're going to have to take the sharp flint knife of the word of God and cut those appetites, those cravings, and those desires. Once again, Jesus said, if your members cause you to stumble, cast, I'll cut it off. In other words, decapitated. It's better to enter into life maimed than to lose your life because you're not willing to part with your lust. Hello? Hello? It was to be done by the heads of families. Abraham did it. You follow what I'm saying? Joshua did it. It was done by persons in authority. Once again, Joshua was in authority. So far, he was the one that circumcised the children of Israel. It's to be done in the presence of the family members. When John was um, circumcised, it was done. The family members were right there. It was done accompanied by naming the child. Remember? When, when they named John, they just circumcised, they named him. When they circumcised Jesus, they named him. Amen. You with me? Y'all with me? Yeah. G uh, uh, Genesis uh, lets us know that Abraham circumcised Isaac and called him Isaac. It was, to be f it was first performed on Abraham, so Abraham was a type. He, he was the one that started his seed, his lineage. So Jesus, once again, was the first one under the new covenant to be circumcised. You follow what I'm saying? His heart was circumcised. And so now, everyone who's born in his lineage, born again, guess what? We ought to be circumcised. So our circumcision is of the heart and not of the flesh. But it affects our heart and it affects our flesh. That means we cut it off. It's no longer there. We've taken the knife of the word of God. The Bible says the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. So we take it and we cut it. Some people struggle with things in their flesh. Take, use the word of God to cut it off, to put it to death. Hello, somebody. I'm telling you about the devil. The devil is so, he's mean, man. He's, he's dirty. He's just so deceitful. The scripture tells, tells us that, you know, that Jesus spoiled principalities. He robbed them. 
rob them of their power against the believer. Yeah. So they're powerless and ineffective against us, Eddie. <laughs> so what, since he's powerless, since he don't have nothing to use, no equipment or armor to use, guess what he uses? He uses deception. So he comes to you and lie to you and gets you to do things against yourself. Remember, uh, the, 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 um, the, the Bible lets us know that God said to uh, Balaam, do not curse the people of God. Balak called, or hired Balaam to curse the people of God. And he said, you can't curse what God has blessed. So he tell him, you will not take up an oracle and curse the people of God. But tell him that God said that he cannot, you, I cannot curse whom God has blessed. And every time he went to, to another place to, to, to curse the people of God, only blessings came out of his mouth. He can only say what God tell him to say. But guess what, people? He finally told Balak, listen, since I can't curse him, I can tell you a secret that will cause the people of God to bring curses on themselves. So that's the devil's strategy. Since he can't curse you, he'll convince you to do things to bring curses on your own life. <laughs> Y'all shout it out. Because he lies to you. He tells the people of God, you're in bondage. You, you in bondage. You, you just said the other. And what, what it is is that he's lying to you because what he don't want you to understand is this, is that, listen, you got to check your perspectives. Either you're sick trying to get healed or you're healed and the devil trying to put sickness on you. Now, which way you look at it? So if you look at it, well, I'm sick and, the de and the, I'm just sick and I got to get healed. No, well, that's the wrong perspective. You need to change the way you look at it. You are healed by his stripes. I am healed. It's the devil that's coming to trying to put sickness on me. Hallelujah. So therefore, I got to fight him off. I got to stand and resist him in the faith. See that? Different perspective. See, it's like getting a glass, putting some water in it halfway. Either it's half empty or half full. It's uh, depending on what you look at. If I give you directions and say, go down to the red light, well, that light has a yellow. It has green as well. Hello. So therefore, I can say, go to the green light. So it's in a, what's, what's your perspective? Your view, imagery. Come on, people. Everybody say perspective. perspective. So what you're looking at? So you can either hold to this right here. I'm free. I am free. The whom the Son is set free is free indeed. Now the devil's trying to bring me back into bondage, but I stand against him. I reason, no devil, you're not going to tempt me to go that way. No, I'm not entertaining that thought. I'm not going there. I'm not calling that old girlfriend. I'm not, come on somebody. Because the devil have you thinking that, that you, 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 just, uh, you just got demons in you and you just say, uh, because he lies to you. Lies to the saints of God. And as a result, cause their own defeat. And then we start compromising and say, well, you know what? I've been like this before. And, you know, I know I can't, I can't do nothing with these feelings or whatever, so I know I'm going to give into it, so I might as well go ahead and give into it right now. That's because you listen to the devil. And you don't realize that all he's been spoiled and stripped of all his power, rights, and authority against you. Can you shout amen? amen. People don't know it, so they walk in the flesh. Well, your daddy was like that still. My daddy ain't like that no more because I got a different daddy. My daddy lives in heaven, and my father don't have that kind of stuff going on in his bloodline. So when you start talking like that and telling the devil what the word of God says, you know what he does is back off, and it cuts your flesh. Ooh. I make it hurt now, man. I make it hurt. I bring it to pain and death. Hallelujah. Amen. We're going to obey God. No, we're going to obey God. We're going to do what God says do. And every time you, you cut it with that flint knife, whack it, flesh just falls off. It loses power over your life. Until now, you're free to walk in obedience. That's what we want to get to a place where we're free to walk in obedience. So when God comes along and says, give all your money, you can do that. Because you, you ain't trying to save yourself because yourself is already dead. Hello, somebody. God told me to do something, man, that's going to hurt me financially. Whew. Glory to God. It's going to hurt me financially. But I reckon myself to be dead. If that's what you want. Not my will, but your will be done. Oh, can you shout amen? amen. And when you do stuff like that, boy, the father just smiles. He gets this big grin on his face. Oh, that's my beloved son whom I'm well pleased. I'm well pleased. I'm well pleased. Guys, you, wanna, you, want, you want Jesus, the Father, to say things about you like he said about Jesus. 
That's my son, man. I'm well pleased. I'm pleased with Eddie. I'm pleased with Van Rea. That's my daughter. God got to bragging on Job one day, man. He said, hey, you consider my servant Job? He ought to be able to say the same thing like you. There's not like a perfect and upright man. Man, one that fears God and shoots evil, avoids evil at all costs. No, you won't get Job to curse me and die. Hmm? So when the devil comes and attack you every way, every, and smack you every way but loose. The whole entire outcome, you look back and say, God can say about you, see, I told you, devil, you couldn't make Mother Robinson fall. How many of you know right now there's some things in your life that used to pin you down to the mat like a wrestler? Don't pin you down no more. Now remember those same things that one time you fall and stumble, fall and stumble, fall and stumble. Now you don't even get tempted by it no more. See? See that? That means that it can happen in every area of your life. And some things we thought that, oh, no, I'll never get to the other side of. And boy, look at us now. You go, my goodness, where are those little devils that used to chase me all the time with this stuff? Where y'all at? Where y'all now? Uh-huh, see, the blood of Jesus cleansed me. See, you don't boast in yourself, you boast in God. David said, my soul shall make a boast in the Lord. The yeah, will see yeah. here, the will be glad. Don't wait for the devil to attack you. Get on the offensive. Get your sword out, man, to get the biggest one you can find. Guess what, devil? God's word says. <laughs> Just antagonize him. He do it to you. Doesn't he do it to you? Now, I'm talking to someone saying, you go around be, being a bully and picking a fight. <laughs> I believe in the spirit. We ought to pick a fight and win it. How do you pick a fight with the devil? Go and cast the devil out of somebody that needs it. Glory to God. Let me stop. Amen. Hallelujah. Y'all got something out of that tonight? Amen. Come on, throw your hands up in the air. We hope that you have received fresh insight into the Word of God through this message recorded for your own spiritual enrichment and personal edification. Thank you for your interest in our media ministry, and we pray that you have victory today through our Lord Jesus Christ.